Do we really know our friends? Do we really know our families? And do we really know ourselves? Are we rational agents who are able to make autonomous, logical decisions? Or are we animals chained to our own strange, secret natures? And here's a much more pressing question. Can I survive interviewing two guests at once? Well, you'll find out soon enough, dear listener, because coming up on the show, we have two guests. We have uh, Yang Ge and Jeremy Tiang. They're going to be coming on to talk about the book they you know, respectively wrote and translated Strange Beasts of China. So, needless to say, I was very thrilled to have these two on, and the conversation was, well, it was hard for me to keep up, because they're both so sharp and have so many interesting things to say about Strange Beasts, as you might expect. But uh, before the interview, we're going to do the Trishific News, the translated Chinese fiction news. Of course, I'm excited about that too, so let's get to it. So the first news item is actually something I was talking about with uh, Jeremy just before we started the interview. It's a book uh, that he translated that will be coming out through Columbia University Press in September this year, 2021. It's uh, a novel called Far Away by Lo Yichin. It's from Taiwan. It's Taiwanese literature, something which I really need to do more of on the show. I'm actually, I had a shower thought about doing a Taiwan season um, at some point, I guess, this coming year. I think that could be fun. But yeah, in any case, I'll just read the first blurb, the uh, first paragraph of the blurb for this book, because um, I do think it sounds interesting. And I guess some of the books that come out through academic presses like uh, Columbia University Press sometimes don't end up with as much visibility as books that are coming out through Penguin and the like. So I think it would be good to give this one a little bit of a bump. So here's the first half of the blurb. In Taiwanese writer Lo Yichin's Far Away, a fictionalized version of the author finds himself stranded in mainland China, attempting to bring his comatose father home. Lo's father has fle had fled decades ago, abandoning his first family to start a new life in Taiwan. Oh, sorry. After travel between the two countries becomes politically possible, he returns to visit the son he left behind, only to suffer a stroke. The middle-aged protagonist ventures to China where he embarks on a protracted struggle with the Byzantine hospital regulations while dealing with re relatives he barely knows. Meanwhile, back in Taiwan, his wife is about to give birth to their second child. Isolated in a foreign country, Lo mulls over his life, dwelling on his difficult relationship with his father and how becoming a father himself has changed him. Um, Jeremy told me this book uh, was a tricky one to translate because it's so complex and strange at times but he said it, I think he said it was a, a beautiful piece of literature so this is one to keep your eye on so it won't be out for whoa, more than half a year but um, I shall be keeping my eye on it for sure so that's our first piece of news here's our second piece of news so long-time listeners will probably notice that in these news segments we have pretty consistently at least one piece of news about Chinese sci-fi in translation and here is some really crazy news, kind of about Chinese sci-fi literature, kind of about it in translation, but maybe more it's about uh, TV. <laughs> um, it's a three-body piece of news. You might have caught this over Christmas. Some pretty mental shit uh, I tweeted on uh, everyone's favorite website, Twitter, um, saying this was like something out of a Murong Shuetsun novel, or at least the two ones you can get in translation, because um, it's about like, well, it appears to be about corporate revenge, quite murderous revenge or something. But yeah, I'll, I'll stop hinting and I'll start saying. A man called Lin, Lin Chi, Nin Chi, who was uh, a billionaire millennial and the guy who acquired and sold, I guess, or managed the, I guess, film, movie, media rights for um, Neil Tsushin's three-body problem is dead of poisoning, of being poisoned by, um, well, the most likely, most likely suspect is one of his uh, colleagues in the company he worked at, or owned, I guess, Yuzu, who were a gaming company best known for a uh, online strategy game based off a of Game of Thrones, Game of Thrones Winter is Coming. And yes, I am reading this off the article I'm going to link to in the show notes. Um, so yeah, I, rather than laying out the uh, min minutia of this news story. I will link to the New York Times coverage of it in the show notes, but other sources are certainly available. This one's this story's been covered in many uh, uh, media outlets and news outlets, so you can just Google like three-body poisoning, and you'll have all sorts of different yeah, articles you can read 
in English about it. It's just absolutely mental. Quite shocking, actually, and I don't like to throw around words like shocking. I prefer words like mental, but I would go f so far as to say this is pretty nuts. The stakes, I think, for Three Body are maybe higher than... For the, sorry, the stakes for the Three Body Netflix adaptation are perhaps higher than one would at first think, or they're as high as I might have suspected, which is, like, insanely high. Okay, last piece of news. So, long-time listeners may have also noticed I often lift news from Paper Republic, or I'll cover something they've done, and we're doing that again for our third news item, but this time in a very meta way. We're doing news about Paper Republic's news. They've started doing a news roundup. Uh, the very first one went up online on January 6th, um, and it's pretty good because it's mostly just a collection of links uh, broken up into categories. Um, so click the link in my show notes to get to their um, basically <laughs> collection of really interesting links. But they're they're broken up into news, events, extracts, and stories. These are stuff you can read online. Uh, reviews and releases, and media. And I'm slightly biased here because one of the media links is to my podcast episode on Guffey's Peach Blossom Paradise. But whatever, that's not why I'm covering it. <laughs> I'm covering it because it's a great resource for, uh, I guess, you guys, the listeners. So yeah, go check that out. Now, it is time to go to the interview, but I am going to be slightly cheeky and plug uh, the show's Patreon first. So be forewarned. Uh, the reason I'm doing it this time is because I've started... I've kind of got a standard format for uh, some of the bonus episodes set up, uh, preliminary thoughts. So basically, after I finish a book that I'm likely or I'm definitely going to cover on the show, I'll kind of unload my reaction, so to speak, to it, my initial thoughts on the book into like a bonus episode. So these are available in two places on the show's Patreon, which you can get access to uh, from one USD a month or more if you want to be generous. Or if you would rather get access to all the bonus shows with a one-off payment, I have a premium feed on Podbean uh, where you can get everything for 10 USD and then you never have to pay anything again. Uh, both, links to both of these are on the support page on the uh, my Podbean homepage for the website, churchofic.podbean.com. Um, there's other ways to support the show too. They're all on the support page. I will stop begging for money now because I think as we are ushered into digital serfdom by the virus, um, as that process is sped up, this is <laughs> this is life for a lot of people asking for money online. You guys will be hearing more and more of it, I think. That's my prediction for the future. Uh, but political rants aside, let's get on with the interview. So I'm on the show with Yang Ge and Jeremy Tiang, the writer and translator of Strange Beasts of China. So the first time we got two guests on the show at the same time. So I'm very excited. To both you guys, Happy New Year, belated Merry Christmas, et cetera, et cetera. How are you both doing? I am doing okay, relatively, I think. Um, it's been, you know, quite um, a dramatic beginning of a new year. But I heard um, as soon as the Chinese New Year happens, which is the real turning point of the year, everything will be all right. So <laughs> just, <laughs> just waiting for that, uh, which will be, I don't know, somewhere in February to kick yeah. in and then this world is going to be cleansed instantly. Well, it's not too far off now. And Jeremy, how, how are you doing? Well, same here, really. I, I feel like we're still in the dregs of the year of the rat. And yeah, from I think it's February 12th. Um, hopefully things will be in a more stable place. Yeah, um, I'm pardon my ignorance. What's the next animal after the rat? Um, it's the ox. The ox, right. Okay, a larger animal. Um, both your names have popped up on this show quite a lot, either in passing or in the news, uh, the news segments I do at the start. And of course, we've we've covered one of your uh, books, Jan, on the show before, uh, Chili Bean Pace Clan. So the listeners might be a wee bit familiar with who you both are, but just for like a consistency's sake and for any new listeners, can you both tell us a wee bit about yourselves and what you do? And maybe Jan, if you want to go first. I am a writer. I mostly write fiction. I actually only write fiction. Um, <laughs> and now I'm I'm writing. Oh well, I say I write both in Chinese and in English. But the reality reality is that I can only really write in one language. <laughs> 
um, for a relatively long period of time. And, and so mostly um, my writing would be in Chinese and I have um, a number of books in Chinese <laughs> that was published mostly um, actually throughout my 20s. I would mm. say. And so this one in particular, Strange Beasts of China, and in Chinese is Yi Shou Zhi. And I wrote this book many years ago, and sort of like the first novel I, I've ever written in my 20s, I would say. And yes, yeah, so, and now I am based in Norwich, and I just did an um, accredited writing MFA um, at the university here, and in uh, University of East Anglia. And and then I was stopped from making any further plan by the circumstance. <laughs> so I'm, I'm in origin doing this podcast now. Yeah, I've heard um, University of East Anglia. That's like the place for creative writing in academia in the UK. Is is that why you went for it? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I've I like when I was thinking about that, I wanted to do a um a MFA or an MA. I wanted to do a creative writing and degree and yeah that was most people recommended this one to me and uh, we and we came to Norwich like my family and before I officially decided I wanted to take the offer um, and I really fell in love with the city with like I think it's a really nice place especially for people who are having a who has like a small child and I think it's really family friendly so yeah I think it's both the university and also the city seems to be the right place for us to be like say two almost three years ago when my son was only a few months old that definitely seems like the right place it's very kind of you know it's a tranquil and kind of a relaxed place um and now seems even more so and it's kind of like really tucked in so (laughs) so yeah yeah that's um that's relatable. Me and my girlfriend just moved from basically a little cabin hut thing in the countryside to uh, the suburbs I grew up in, and yet mm. everywhere's everywhere. They were fairly peaceful places before, but now that everyone's indoors all the time, they're they're really peaceful. So one small mm. upside. Um, so J- Jeremy, uh, what about a little bit about yourself and and what you do? So I'm a novelist, playwright, and translator from Chinese. Um originally from Singapore, and I've been based in New York for the last eight years. Cool. And you've, it occurred to me, you have translated one of the things we've covered on the show. It was a play, um, not a novel. It was um, Jensa Ann's Ocean Hot Pot, um, and that was Mm. when I was lucky enough to attend in Edinburgh. So that's, uh, yeah, both of you guys have, in a sense, been on the show before, but now you're really both on the show. So great to have you both. Um, keeping things moving, yeah, and you mentioned that this book is one one of several, I guess, that was pub- you wrote and was published when you were in your 20s. So I think it would be good to start the interview by looking back in time. It's like the kind of the origins of the book, both in the original Chinese and this um, English translation. So uh, first question is just for you, Yan. Um, what can you tell us about the like uh, inception of uh, Yi Shou Zhe, the original Chinese edition of Strange Beasts of China? I'm glad that I've been asked this question like sort of repeatedly recently since mm-hmm. the English version came out. So I've had time to refresh my memory or to make up a fake <laughs> series of <laughs> memories just to cover this question. And um, so that was literally um, 15 years ago. And um, right. and and I think I think for me the main incentive was that um, I think it was really commissioned. So there was this editor uh, who works for this magazine, like sort of like literary journal for say high school or college students so for young people mm. and it's called so and uh, youth literature i suppose and it's right. based in Beijing. and then this editor he um i don't know why but he was talking to me to say would you want to write like a serial serialized um novel or just write something for us and so we can maybe publish whatever this project is like every issue like monthly basis and then I thought it would be very good for me to have some so I was at that point not in a very in a very sort of low point of my life and my mom had just passed away maybe I don't know maybe at that point maybe just say one month ago at that point so 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 I was just really trying to get something to have like a certain structure with my life and this 
one book like Strange Beasts of China was the only thing, the only the only book or the only kind of relatively major project and I did based on the commission. I think it was really because I just wanted to have some structure to my life. Mm. And then this editor. And so I think that this very nature of being commissioned determines um, a the structure of this book which is, um, so we, we published one chapter um, each issue for that magazine on each issue. So you kind of wanted the, the chapter to be sort of relatively self-contained. So that's why each chapter in this novel is kind of like, you know, you could really read it individually. It's like a small story, but um, I, I suppose all of those stories are um, still like linked. And, and then and then this editor specifically said to me, please make it straightforward because our readers are mostly, um, you know, like quite young. So don't, don't make it too obscure. That's what he said to me. Mm. Obviously, I had even back then the reputation of writing obscure things. <laughs> and, and so I think I really uh, like kept that in mind when I was writing. So, so I think um, Strange Beasts of China were really kind of different from the majority of my writing, like my books, and in Chinese, and um, it's quite fast moving. It's quite plot driven, and and then I remember specifically that I decided to use lots of short sentences, and um, and then the sentences were even in a way kind of fragmented, uh, which wouldn't be like you know something I would have um chose if it wasn't for this sort of heads up of like make it straightforward. Although I don't really know how if this decision had actually made it straightforward, but that's my interpretation of it. And um, yeah, so I just did that sort of based on um, chapter by chapter basis and, and and being chased by this poor editor who decided to commission me. And I was such a terrible, terrible person to work with. And I was 21 years old. So, so I was quite, oh, nice. yeah. you know, I was, um, I don't think I was personally getting drunk, but when I was writing this, I was, I, I, I lived in student rental house and mm. like this apartment just off campus. And we have three bedrooms. So I had, I was in one of those bedrooms and then the other two bedrooms had like a couple, uh, two couples, one, uh, one of them, are both are poets, like they were sort of postgraduate lit uh, students in like Chinese literature department. And then the other one was a bass player of a rock band and then his girlfriend. So I was living in this house while I was writing this. And I remember so clearly, like, because I always stay up late and then write um, in the nighttime. And then when I finish my writing, and then there will be all sorts of noise going on while I was trying to like, because they were having party in this apartment like every day. <laughs> and I'd finish the story and then I'd go out and it'd be like bodies, you know, just lying <laughs> on the floor of the <laughs> sitting room, like getting absolutely hammered, all those people having partied all night. And like all the bottles of beer bottles and some kind of, you know, um, so they, back then there was this sort of a small bottles of baiju, like Chinese liquor, it's mm. like Araguata or just like those really cheap and strong liquor mm. bottles, like everywhere. And the bathroom would be absolutely disgusting. <laughs> oh, no. So it's kind of a, um, I mean, that I think it's a backdrop of this story. Actually, if you do read this book, you, you get a lot of that, a lot of like uh, aggressive drinking, a lot of like mm. you know, being sick and throwing up in the bathroom. And it was really like the, the surrounding when I was writing it. But I think, you know, think about it like now, and I think psychologically, um, all of those noises, those backdrop noises really um, have permeated and then have really become part of this writing experience. And then it, they, they have been integrated. Isn't? And also, I think the reason I live, I, I decided to live in that apartment, um, it was really a reflection, I think, of where I was um, psychologically. Like, I think that kind of chaos, that kind of um, mm. getting out of control, that sense, was really how I felt about my life. So I, I positioned myself in that place and where I wrote this book. So it's all, it's all like a reflection of everything that's going on and in the background, also part of it, yeah. Sorry, I spoke too much. It's always, you have to like, have like a bell to say, yeah, this is too much. Now stop and I'll stop. <laughs> this, this well, one, of, <laughs> one of the things I hate most about myself when I do these things is I'm not, I've never been good at cutting in on other people in a, what's the word, like a socially apt way. I tend to just go, uh, uh, um, um, um. And sometimes I don't even cut through. And sometimes it's easy to edit out. Sometimes I just sound like a, a goon. 
but no that anyway that was a great answer so it doesn't doesn't match it I'm sorry I need to I just try to find a timer actually (laughs) find a timer for myself (laughs) oh no don't don't put that much pressure on yourself um it's interesting that you were 21 because I knew you're in your 20s I didn't realize it was like barely in your 20s but that I did notice is that there's a lot there is a lot of alcohol drinking in in the book um because the cover is this very sort of elegant at least in the English edition it's a very like elegant feather dropping to the ground I wouldn't have guessed that so much of the book the main character would be in a sort of like a dive bar knocking back beers but I'm not complaining let's go on to the next question it's a question for you both um what can you tell the listeners about how the English edition Strange Beasts of China uh, published by Tilted Access came about so I'm throwing this one to both of you whoever wants to take it first can go for it I was I was trying to remember how we met actually Yen. um I'm not sure I do, which is very in keeping with the um, ethos of the book. Um, mm. I remember meeting for coffee in New York um, after mm. you'd been on that mad multi-city tour of Chinese writers. Um, mm. And we sort of ran around the city um, and, and you were with Hu Qingfang. And mm. I named a coffee shop and then got there and found that the coffee shop had shut down, which is a very New York experience. Um, so we met um, at a theatre cafe instead. And, and after that, you sent me the book. Um, but I feel like we had met way before that. And I don't remember how. Do you? Um, yeah, I do. And um, I was just about to say when you ask, um, we, we met at the British Museum. Do you remember with um, Helen Wong and Francis um, from Leeds oh. and Nikki Harmon? And I was with Nikki because I was, um, yeah. yeah, so she she was, I don't know who arranged that meeting, um, but Nikki was saying, uh, we're going to go meet those people and, and you were there. And you, you I, I remember that time when, when we met and you talked about how much you wanted to move back to England. I think you had just moved to the States because when you were introducing yourself, you said, I've, I've been based in New York for the last eight years and I thought is that how long has it been now like since because mm. I still remember the first time you you talk about um yeah because you were in the UK for like 10 years is it or more yeah, than that that's right yeah mm-hmm. yeah it's quite a star lineup of um people all gathered in the museum at least in terms of uh, translated Chinese fiction because <laughs> <laughs> Helen well, she works there do you know that right mm, yeah in the coin yeah, yeah, section yeah. Thing. yeah yeah so so that's um yeah and and i i personally just couldn't believe i still couldn't quite believe that and um, jeremy decided to translate this book yeah i i i said on um, at different occasions but it really is like a blessing is a is such a it's it's something that i couldn't quite believe still and and i thought that i'm really blessed to have jeremy translate and um, to pick up and then to translate this this book i feel incredibly blessed that i got to translate this book oh and, and to live inside it for so long um because it really is um a bit like an out-of-body experience um <laughs> yen's writing it it kind of literally takes you outside of your own mind and i i think because because you wrote it in such an episodic way um mm. the we sort of did the first chapter as a standalone story to see what would happen. Mm. Um, and it was, it was published by Two Lions Journal. Um, right. And, and then I guess much like the experience with, with the editor and the serialization, it was like, well, let's keep going and see what happens. Um, mm. And then at some stage, Deborah Smith got involved and Tilted Axis picked up the book. Um, and Deborah Smith, she's the uh, the boss of Tilted Access, right? And she's a translator of Korean into English. Is, am I right? Yes, Deborah Smith is the Booker Prize winning um, Korean translator of many books by Han Kang and Bae Swa. Mm. Um, and she used her Booker Prize winnings to set up Tilted Access Press, which publishes books um, predominantly, but not exclusively by women um, from Asia. Right. Yeah. I got my girlfriend onto reading uh, The Vegetarian just recently. So I guess uh, Deborah Smith's fresh in my mind for that reason. That's a really, 
that's one of the best translated books I've read. Um, but I, yeah, I guess we can move on from the origins of the book. One thing I forget forgot to put in the list of uh, questions to you guys is like kind of what the book's about. So I'll, I'll just read the blurb from the back. <laughs> and I think that should clue in anyone who doesn't know what we're talking about. Um, so the, the hook line is, all we have are stories. And here's the blurb. In the city of Yong'an, an amateur cryptozoologist is commissioned to uncover the secrets of its fabled beasts. These creatures live alongside humans in near inconspicuousness, some with ancient forebears, others engineered as artificial breeds. Guided and often misguided by her elusive university professor and his scrappy student sidekick Zhong Liang, our narrator finds herself on a mission to track down each species. Part detective story, part metaphysical inquiry, Strange Beasts of China addresses existential questions of identity, being, love, morality with whimsy and grace. So I, I, am, I did a bonus episode from my Patreon feed where I sort of did my preliminary thoughts on the book and I tend to be a bit lazy when I record those. So I use the blurb and other things as a jump off point to have something to talk about. And sometimes if a book's blurb doesn't really describe it, I grumble about it. But I think this there's not much that this blurb doesn't hit on as a, like a summary of what you're in for if you're picking up the book, apart from maybe all the, the drinking sessions. <laughs> Is there anything else we should mention or do you think that's a good intro to the book? That sounds good to me, actually. And I'm very impressed you read out that um, word because <laughs> I'd always say that's a zoologist. And then I saw that word, you know, the word, the I don't know how to say oh, that. Crypto, actually. cryptozoologist. Cryptozoologist. And then I looked it up. I was like, oh, that's what it is. And and it's um it's one of those experiences, you know, it's like um it's like you, if you're um looking at the world through a language and this language is a lens, and sometimes um a tiny corner of that lens is just frogged, and then you have to mm. sort of wipe it clean, and the moment you wipe it clean, and now you can see that very specific like dot in the world <laughs> which was previously covered by the like the non-existence of this word and now you have this word you see that <laughs> and I thought that was yeah it's it's an interesting word it's very long but to me anyway it rolls off the tongue quite easily unlike maybe I don't know uh, inconspicuousness that's I was worried I was going to mispronounce <laughs> that one and it's an interesting one too because everyone well you don't need to know too many words to know what a zoologist is but mm. uh, you don't need great English to know what crypto means but you don't necessarily know what a cryptozoologist is when they're put together unless someone tells you that you know what what the word what the prefix crypto is doing there that it means mist, you know Loch Ness Monster and those sorts of beasts but um, <laughs> we've, I've totally gone off track um, <laughs> or at least I've waffled a bit too long, but I seem to have been waffling in the right direction because the next questions are about the beasts uh, inside the book. Because as you were saying, the, the, it's kind of like one beast per chapter or per story or per episode in the episodic structure. So the beasts are, are, are really key. You know, It's not just that the word beast is in the title. So the beasts in the book themselves they're quite vulnerable all of them they're all quite human some of them but not all of them are innocent some of them but not all of them are quite jaded or world weary maybe uh, some but not all of them are very deadly or could I, or could transform you in some not particularly or not completely pleasant way uh, some are angelic some aren't it's just kind of hard down, hard to boil all these beasts down into one thing. So it's hard for me to boil down what I want to say into a question or a statement. But I do have something I'll try and ask uh, Yen. Uh, to what extent, Yen, are these beasts completely your own creation? And if they're not completely your own creation, uh, what sources did you draw on for ideas or inspiration? I think realistically, I cannot say those are completely my own creation because even subconsciously, right, I must mm. have been influenced by something I was reading um, or I had read or watching more likely. <laughs> um, yeah, so, but but I, I, I don't remember that I consciously borrowed anything from anywhere, but that is not to say that I'm incredibly original or something. And I think the idea of doing this kind of um, 
um, it's like an encyclopedia sort of um, this, like you have all the entries, like, like the format of this book. And I think I definitely borrowed that from the, you know, the, the Chinese and um, the classic book is called Shanghai Jing. So it's, mm. it's like the classic of mountains and seas. So it's kind of those, um, the format is, um, I think it's borrowed from books like that. And then, and then in terms of um, the creation of the beasts, I think the most difficult part for me is to come up with the names of the beasts. So I think the first chapter, the first story um, was the easiest one was like Bei Shang Shou. So it's sorrowful beasts. And it really came to me quite naturally, like this name. And then and then I wrote the story um based on that. And and I and I think I sort of developed so obvious like I don't know if it's, this is a spoiler, but like for a sorrowful beasts, so they the the sort of the punchline <laughs> for them is that they don't smile. Once they smile, they couldn't stop and then they would die. And so it's kind of, it came directly like this um, sort of a essential trait um, came from their name. And, and then uh, similarly, I think um, after finishing Sorrowful Beasts, so when I was like set on to um, the mission of writing chapter two, the second beast, it took me so long to find the name of this beast. So what I was trying to get was something like Beishang, like like this kind of name, the naming of them, like the name doesn't feel um, specifically classic or modern, if you know right. what I mean. It's like, cause, uh, cause in Chinese, um, like in the Chinese version <laughs> of, of this book is, uh, there's a little bit of a mixture so the beginning and the end of each chapter is sort of um written in sort of quasi <laughs> classic chinese and then the middle right. part um was um modern chinese so i think i wanted the name to kind of um to maybe to be a bit timely in the sense it could be from classic Chinese, but also they were uh, not very strange because you don't want to use like a character that is really obscure that you have to really look it up, like even as a Chinese reader. So you want something like Beishan, like, you know, the, the characters, the, the phrase was like um, commonplace enough, but also it has like this sense of um, ancientness in it so I was mm. like looking for things like that that could be both interpreted like an old name or a new name so you don't really know if it's old or new and and so that was the the biggest challenge I think for me um to create so to speak on those beasts is to find the right names for them and um, that carries this sort of timeless quality would you say um mm. and so I and then I think I I came came up with the second one, which is the opposite of sorrowful, Beishang is xi le, is joyless. And then I went on from there and then, yeah. So I think each time uh, there was the most challenging part was to think of the name. And once I came up with the name and then the rest of like the traits of the beasts and you know their likes and dislikes and or their like hidden secrets and those things seem to be um, well, like now looking back, it seems like everything just fairly just came out very naturally. I mean, the story, but I'm sure I was <laughs> massively <laughs> struggling at that point, like um, 15 years ago when I did it. Uh, but I, 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 I think the sort of um, the decisive moment for each beast to establish as a creature, as a kind of creature, um, was um, was a moment when their names were found, so mm. to speak. Yeah. You've reminded me of something um, that stuck in my brain around Christmas time. I was uh, getting a lift from my stepdad in the car. And normally him and my mom, they listen to like BBC Radio 2, which is a very, mm. it's a radio station for people maybe about their age and a bit younger. And it uses like pretty, it's not too high minded. You won't hear of any, many strange vocabulary words on there. But this day, I think he was listening to the classic radio station. I guess he's looking for more chilled out music or peaceful, beautiful music in these times. Uh, but the radio host was um, quite happy being a bit more intellectual. And he just threw out this phrase, uh, nominative determinism. And I was like, whoa, that's a word for my undergraduate. <laughs> What's that? But it's the it's a thing's nature is determined by its name. So yeah, I guess mm. <laughs> I just got a flashback to sitting in the car listening to whatever radio station that was. Because again, I've got some nomin nominative determinism um, for these beasts. Um, I thought it would be good to talk slightly 
about a little bit about the Shanghai Jing, because um, we talked a little bit about that, the three of us by email, kind of in the run up to the show. And it's it's been a weird thing for me, uh, because in like three or four things at once that I've been reading or have been involved with, the Shanghai Jing's come up. Uh, I'm reading Beijing Coma right now. That references a lot. It a lot. Your book has a sort of a the opening bits of the chapters uh, reminded me a little bit of some of the excerpts of the Shanghai Jing I've read, where it kind of just describes like where a particular beast lives, what it likes to eat, and um, what they look like. That reminded me of those excerpts, and j- even just beast trees have been on my mind because um, mm. occasionally I'll ask. So my girlfriend just finished a PhD on uh, wolves in Anglo-Saxon literature, but occasionally I forget what it was that she did for her master's. So whenever I forget, she reminds me that her master's dissertation was on medieval European bestiaries, which also have all these strange animals. Some of them are real, some you'd never ever meet, and some are strange imaginings of what a like a panther is, but they're only half correct or whatever. So is there? I don't know. Is there anything else either of you would want to say about? how us as modern people get revisited or by or how we revisit these old b series or what relevance they might have to us today is there anything we could say i think there's um something very human about the beasts in this book mm. um, and for a lot of them um it felt like the entry point was the intersection with their beastliness and their humanity Um, Because the running theme through the book is how beasts and humans might not be as different as we would like to believe. And and in fact, the the, um, narrator often doesn't initially realize that the beasts are beasts. Um, Many of them are very human-like. Many of them assimilate to human society, but there's always some point at which they have to deviate um, or they reveal their essential beastly nature. Mm. But it was it was about finding that that thing that made them different, that point of difference, as well as the things that made them um, similar and able to relate to the protagonist. Mm, yeah, and that's um, that's I guess that's an evergreen theme for what it's like to live in a society or being part of one. You will have to meet people who are. I guess everyone you meet is similar. You know, there's some percent the same as you, some percent different. But yeah. I see what you mean there. It kind of goes on to our, the next question I've got lined up, which literally starts um, with the sentence, the human characters aren't as human as we might first think. Um, so our, our narrator, I'm just going <laughs> to, I have a long question written out. I'm just going to read it. Um, the narrator is a young woman and the rest of the recurring cast are pretty much the men in her life. I think more or less all the secondary characters are, are, are the guys that she meets on a daily or regular basis. And everyone pretty much uh, turns out to be a mystery unto themselves, not only the narrator, but my feeling is she is maybe, the narrator herself is maybe the biggest mystery of them all in some ways. Um, Because, you know, if you're seeing out of someone's eyes, then you can't see the person Mm. themselves in a way. Um, I was kind of reminded a wee bit of the Chili Bean Pace Clan, because as uh, Nikki Harmon uh, reminded me when she was on the show, Uh, talking about the book the book isn't told in first person the narrator is a character but she's sort of present in the story by her absence she's only mentioned in reference like I think she's she's uh, ill or mentally unwell at the time where she's recovered so she's this invisible young woman who's sort of observing in quote marks her father's wayward life or at least describing it or recounting it. Um, so again, trying to <laughs> pull a question out of this rambling um, line of thought, a question for both of you. Do you think it would be fruitful to start reading the book assuming that everyone is a strange beast? Whether it's your first reading or a rereading, is that a fun or interesting or useful way to read the book? Mm. Should Jer- I think Jeremy should go first to mm. prevent me from speaking too much. <laughs> Um, on one level, I think it's a good um, way to read any book, just mm. to assume things are not what they seem and everyone is some sort of strange beast. Um, but talking about invisible narrators, um, I, I think there's something very intriguing about the fact that the protagonist of this book, the main voice that we spend time with, we never find out her name. And right. that's... I, th- I think quite 
that that's obviously a very conscious choice. Um, and it's something that I think allowed me to identify with her to a perhaps dangerous degree um, as I was translating it. Um, and I, I, I think the process of reading the book, certainly of translating it, was you get a kind of Stockholm syndrome with the beast. Um, mm. Like with, with a book of this kind, I think you would expect to come out on the side of the humans, right? Like if, if there's a human tribe and a beastly tribe, you would kind of expect to get to the end and be like, oh, well, I'm human. Right. Um, but, but whereas that, that's not at all what happens and you come out, um, or at least I did, questioning your own humanity and how porous the borders are around what you think of as, as normal life. Totally, yeah. It only can take a very small change or disturbance to completely flip things upside down. I know I've experienced that a few times in my own life. Oh, I've lost my train of thought. Let me, let me think for a second. <laughs> Oh, I mean, we're all strange beasts. Exactly. We are all strange beasts. Um, yeah, I, I, I have personal stories I could tell from my life and my family's, but I won't. Suffice to say, I think you're definitely right. Um, there are all sorts of things about the people in our lives or the people in the city that we'd never find unless we went investigating that would surprise us or throw, throw, us, um, throw us off kilter. Um, yeah. The, the other thing I was thinking of saying was there's a TV show I really like that has a good example of a narrator. You find out because you're taking his point of view, there you, you, there's things about him you'll never know until the last minute. And that's the TV show, Mr. Robot, but it's not relevant enough to, to, to this book for me to, to talk about it much depth. Um, I will say when I was reading the book, Early on, when we were still kind of getting to know everyone, especially narrator, the narrator, I found myself second guessing. I'm like, wait a minute, have I wrongly assumed that the narrator is specified as a woman? Is her gender unspecified? I don't remember. Um, then I looked at the blurb and it does say um, she it uses the female pronouns for her. And then sure enough, like a few pages later in the book, it's clarified that she's a woman. But it, it made me realize, yeah, wait a minute, there's a little bit of kind of clever... Uh, literary sleight of hand here we're not being told too much about the narrator but our attention or at least my attention wasn't drawn to that fact I was so focused on the beasts and all the people interesting people she's dealing with I didn't I obviously until x number of pages into the book I wasn't trying to figure out who she was but that's often in a lot of books that's the most interesting question who's telling the story let's keep things moving. The next question, uh, the setting. Yeah, I, I almost brought up setting when we were touching on the Shanghai Jing, because at least um, in, to my understanding, as well as describing beasts, the Shanghai Jing sort of describes or is mapping out the places where you can find them and they're sort of imaginary places. And that's also, I think there's a little bit of that in the book we're finding out about uh, the city of Yong'an. And it seems like there's a lot you could say about it um my feeling was that there's a lot of contradictory things about young An, um or amb ambiguous things or resonant things um sometimes i felt for sure it was a stand-in for a real chinese city i think maybe because i'd listened to you guys and yan talk about the book before in other online events i think you said you were living in chongqing at the time so i was wondering oh is everything just a metaphor for different parts of chongqing and other times I thought, no, that seems wrong. This is like a magical city. It's it's transnational or it's not even on our version of Earth. Um, so simple question for both of you. Um, what do you make of Yong An? The city, yeah. Um, the the city I, I was um sort of basing on uh, the Yong An, the fictional city Yong An um, in this book was based on the city I lived in. Back then there was Chengdu, oh, Chengdu but you're sorry. not too wrong to say that's Chongqing because those two cities are very like they're kind of like twin cities mm. and they're very but they're like um, aesthetically they're so different because Chengdu right. was built on this plain and Chongqing is like this very hilly you know it's kind of built on like multiple mountains and it's it's quite beautiful actually in, in that sense because it has it's like San Francisco and it has different layers but, right. but yeah this is a deviation. But um, I, I was thinking about, and even like um, for the previous question, we're talking about like the narrator and then 
And then this one you're talking about like the city. I think what I am probably mostly, this is me analyzing myself um, as a writer and also maybe a person is that um, I think I'm quite into um, ambiguity. And in a sense, when I, when I have a narrator, I'm always um, invested in this idea of an unreliable narrator. And or when I have a narrator, I always sort of toy with this idea of this, you know, you have narrator, you have protagonist, but then when the story begin, like when the novel begin in this sense, and your narrator was only an observer. So she was like a passive um, observer and she was narrating the story, but then gradually she became more and more um, active. And then she became the protagonist. It becomes not being told uh, from her point of view, not only, but also it's about her. So then you have this really blurred line um, of, you know, what she sees and how she's seen by other people or how the story eventually became sort of wrapped around her. Um, and I think similarly for the city um, and that I was really going for this sort of um, this sense of this dual sense of, you know, realism versus magical realism is that I do not want to create a place or a setting where people would just immediately say, oh, this is like pure, you know, fantasy or science fiction or, oh, this is pure like realism. I don't know if I had successfully done it in, in this, in the case of um, Strange Beasts of China and also even now, like whatever I'm writing, you've never, <laughs> you never know if you've actually um, achieved your goal in your head. Um, mm. But um, I just really wanted to have this blurred line and including, you know, like when Jeremy was saying, so um, so that in that sense, I, I, I do wanted to create something that you could see this is in China or is this in purely like an, an imaginary country because nothing was specified. But at the same time, I think you could, you probably could like, put a lot of like descriptions and things you, you you could drag them down to the ground to say oh this is a that's b but mm. at the same time they're kind of quite slippery and and the same i think goes with um, the identity of this writer so um jeremy was saying like this i was never named i think for me um or for the the the, the me who wrote this book um, was that I was trying to uh, play this game where people could almost think I is Yang Ge, like, because I think the format of the Chinese book was that you open this, you have this book and you have this, I is like a writer. And then towards the end, the last bit of it, um, I think um, you, you get to have like the afterward. And I think for the afterward for a while i was playing with this idea when you begin to read the afterward as a read as a reader you think that afterward was from the actual writer as in yang Ge. but then maybe halfway through you realize oh this afterward was also from um this woman like this narrator this fictional writer in this book so i think i i do try to create this sense of um, ambiguity even with the writer's identity i just one is to, it's almost like, is this book, is this book written by this woman in this book? <laughs> this is kind of, mm. sorry, I'm just being, uh, you know, it's like, I, I do not want people to be 100% sure if this book was written by me, Yang Ge, and having created this fictional writer who's writing this book, or maybe this book was written by this fictional character, and, and then I was, and whose name is Yang Ge, the real writer me was never existed oh my, my head's spinning <laughs> you know because sometimes I, I think you do have um this idea where like somebody published a book and to say this book was the book this is like quite of an old-fashioned thing you know someone would mm. write or publish a book to say this book was the book I discovered and but then in fact this book was written by I right but then yeah. you say this is a discover book written so it's kind of like that so I think I was playing with this sense of ambiguity, this like uncertainty. You don't know what is like reality, what is like imaginary world. And both in the sense of the identity of the narrator, the identity of the writer, and then the sort of um, whether being real or not of the city. So yeah, sorry. Okay, I'm going to stop. That's <laughs> no, okay. Great answer. And yeah, I think I, it was the thing I was thinking about because uh, before I read the book, I uh, attended some of the other online events he did where you talked about how the episodic structure came from the fact the Chinese edition was serialized. So I was clued into that, to 
I was clued into how uh, the narrator's submissions to her boss were a little bit like your submissions to your editor and so on. But mm -hmm. I think even if I hadn't known that, the meta, meta textual stuff that you were talking about would have become more obvious to me as I got through it. And I think a lot of readers, like in films and movies, I think people really like meta stuff. It's usually, if it's done well, it's, um, it's pretty enjoyable. And I enjoyed it in this book. And yeah, you're, you're right, I'd forgotten um, I'd forgotten just how surprised I was when I did my English degree way back when I was like 18, 19, 20, 21, how like these, some of the first literature you could get in English, the author felt that you needed some framing to the device to justify why you were reading some person's words. Um, mm -hmm. Like how um, the novel Dracula is a lot of letters and documents and stuff. Um, I think people aren't, you know, either forget or aren't generally aware just how meta some old literature is and it's now that now that we know what a novel is we don't usually need these um justifications for why we're reading someone's story so yeah it's, it's interesting it, it occurred to me um when you mentioned that you were submitting these stories to uh, Qingyan Wenshua youth literature um that like you said you were it's the target readers were like high school kids or maybe college university uh, students and you said yourself you're only 21 so you weren't an awful lot older than them. I had some kind of a similar experience um, for a little while when I was a teacher in China. I was what, like 25 years old. And some, some of the kids I was teaching were like 17, 18. And I couldn't help but think it wasn't that long ago that I was you guys, that I was fretting about my exams mm -hmm. and stuff. Um, so when you were writing, were you thinking about um, your, like your audience trying to like, I don't know, get inside their heads or give them something that you would have liked to have received and read at, at their age was that on your mind at all i think for me it's not really about the age group thing it's probably because obviously i was not like a mainstream person at least as far as the editor was concerned you know <laughs> he was like you're too obscure you're like a weirdo just try to be more mainstream like <laughs> apply like just try to you know appeal to more people and um, i wasn't really thinking about i think um, but like the, the really nice thing about writing this book was since it gets published as I write, you know, so you do get some sort of um, not real time, but you do get some feedback mm, um, right. as you're going through it. And I remember I like so this um, this very um, this very novel when it was first published, like from the magazine on the magazine, and they was voted by the magazine's readers that year to be like the most popular, like the most liked um, story or book or thing. <laughs> On, on the magazine that year so it was like I'm not saying it's like massively popular because the after all it's a literary magazine so you know it's not like but um mm. but it's really good that you could get that real sense of like people do care about it and they're so involved and I think back then people were using um like like a blog <laughs> I was trying you know it's like uh, so so then they do find me on, on my blog and they would like leave some message leave some comments and and so that was very nice and that was probably again like one of the the only experience um in my writing in my you know like the, this, this many years that you will get like um the closest to real-time feedback from the readers as you were writing through this book mm. It was quite uplifting, I think. Yeah, um, but I think because of that, um, again, like this is quite plot driven, this book itself. But I'm not saying it's not necessarily like a bad thing, obviously. But um, um, but I, I do like I do um, put a lot of effort uh, when I was doing this book um, that just to just to make it very intense. <laughs> Yeah, I, I almost like I think you almost like kind of like sometimes you allow yourself I allowed myself to indulge myself into this kind of a, a bad literary taste where so many people just died for no good reason it's like you know it's like in a way everything in this book was like high drama yeah um yeah. But I think it makes sense because um, it doesn't necessarily make I, I feel bad for defending my own bad taste. But uh, I think it doesn't really um, feel too jarring um, because it was narrated by this very young person, like the narration protagonist was mm. this very young and mentally unstable person. So <laughs> I think it's not like very uh, strange to have those like just... 
mm-hmm. heightened emotions and heightened um plots and um, going on all the time yeah so <laughs> i think that is one place we see a gap between her and you yen and that's in the chapter where we get a long excerpt of the protagonist writing um because mm. she's kind of composing a story in real time mm. um, and and the story that she's writing is is I think recognizably cheesier and mm. and kind of more intense and more um, emo than the the book that contains it. Um, so there is this little gap in the meta narrative um, mm. where we sort of see that she's writing in a slightly different register compared to the sophistication of the the entire work. Yeah, and the, was it the editor loves that hyper melodram- melodramatic story, but her friends are like, "What are you doing? This is trash." Was there a chapter I think that actually contains an um, apart like this excerpts of her story? Was mm. it like? Sorry, I'm like I'm asking you guys yeah, that. Is, yeah, <laughs> yeah the prime beast chapter in Yan Shou. Oh yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Um. So two. Hang on a minute. What was the, I've just two things. What was one of them? Crap. Uh, forget it. I'll just ask about the main thing. Um, so, so you um, you were talking about how you felt that it was appropriate for the um, the book to have this kind of slightly melodramatic feeling because the main character and so many of the others are in a sort of a emotionally volatile, fragile place in their lives or their state of mind and maybe at, at, at that age you were it was appropriate for the place you were at in your life mm. you know age age 21 um and I definitely got that reading it and a thing that I've I think I've used this term in one or two places in the last episodes it's just like you know when you think of a very particular framework a way of looking at things and you get hung up in it in a while for a while and the thing I've kind of been hung up on for a while is thinking about both stories and people's in terms of like nerve endings whether the nerve endings are very dulled or like hypersensitive and they do they reduce the signal they pick up or do they multiply it so how muted is a story or how like explosive is it and i was thinking yeah this this uh, if a normal we're getting really stupid here but if a normal nerve ending sensitivity is one and anything below is dulled anything above is hypersensitive then this book's got to be like <laughs> two or three it's um and there was another slightly more gross biological thing i thought of i don't know why maybe it's because some so many of the beasts shed their skins but you know how human beings we have something like 11 layers of skin and you're always shedding your skin or whatever i don't know this <laughs> <laughs> oh well, it might not be 11, but it's some number like that. Um, oh, no. Check your check your medical textbooks to verify what I'm saying. <laughs> but if you lose, if some of your first layer comes off, the layer beneath is actually really smooth and nice, but you're not in any physical danger because, you know, you're only, because it's not, your skin's not been punctured. It's just the very outer layer that, and sorry, this is really gross, but I was just thinking it's almost as if everything in the character has this softer, more vulnerable, but somehow like more beautiful outer coating than, yeah, I don't know, I don't know where I'm going with that, but I kept, it kept popping into my head for some reason. I, I think to summarize what she just beautifully um, put out, it was just everybody in, in this book was just a bit snowflake. That was what it is. Because <laughs> uh, I think that's something, well, I do think that's something you typically get when you are at a very young age, you really kind of um, react mm-hmm. to this world, really, you know, your reaction was so strong, it was unfiltered, and, and you're just like in a very vulnerable yeah. space, and you're just, you know, you're so easy to fall into love, you're so easy to be filled with despair, like everything was just, yeah, I think it, it definitely is um, this book, definitely is from a very young place like not just age surely I think lots of um traits of this book lots of um, qualities were determined by written by a very young person and showing um like the characters were mostly um like very young I think I was reading it like I read Jeremy's translation and I was like uh, reconfigurating on all the characters and I thought 
I knew like in my head, I realized that. So some of the characters, when I wrote them, I thought, oh, okay, this was the old person. But then that person probably was like in the early 30s. <laughs> Yeah, and then I did, you realize this absurd relativity, <laughs> like how you see other people. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. I remember when I was five, I would see 12-year-olds and I'd be like, whoa, scary British giants. But now I see a 12-year-old and I'm like, oh, a little, a little stick person. It's it's all it's all relative. Um I, there was a thing that popped into my head. When I was 18, I thought I'd be very clever and take all the little um short stories I'd written and try and make something I could give away to my friends I made it into a pdf and I named it after a song lyric uh, by a band called Incubus that I really liked as a teenager and there's a line uh it's the start of it's the start of the first verse of a song called pardon me and the first three lines I've just looked up that's what the typing noises were uh, a decade ago I never thought I would be at 23 on the verge of spontaneous combustion woe is me and I kind of yeah I feel like some of the characters I think some of does one of the beasts actually kind of explode maybe not literally but I feel like there's figuratively like, there's a lot of kind of people bursting into flames or yeah flourishing this book into flames, was maybe. definitely my book like among all my books this one was the one that has the most casualty I guess I was reading it I was like how can all those people just die like seriously uh, but yeah I mean it's just um, I don't know if you feel this way um, Angus because um, and you were mentioning say the um, the Chilean Pace clan because those two books are like the most contrasting books of mine and and I think mm. I have got this a lot um, from um, like readers in China or critics to say they just couldn't believe those two books were from the same person. Um, I feel slightly embarrassed by it, um, by this comment. Um, I don't know where I'm getting. Why am I interviewing you? Sorry. <laughs> no. no, you can't. I like it when I get questions I ask back. At me. It's good. Um, no, I was thinking that too. Um, I was thinking, yeah, these are two very different books, I guess. You know, it's like um, for, for any other um well, not for any other author, but for an author who's not an author in translation, I could just go look up all their other books on Wikipedia or Amazon and I could see if there was some common thread connecting the two. So, okay, for for example, uh, an author who's, I think the first two books I read for, by Cormac McCarthy were a very early one by him, Outer Dark and then The Road. And there are a lot of similarities in the story, but the prose style couldn't be more different. One is really sparse, and one is like biblical and crazy and gothic. And I would have, reading those two books, I'd be like, I'd be thinking, well, one's by the young guy, one's by the old guy. There's probably a whole thing in the middle. Um, there's a chronology. I could look it up and verify it and get these books. But with an author like yourself, who's got quite a lot of books uh, in the original Chinese, but just these two and White Horse, I think, in translation, I just kind of work on the assumption I'm missing part of the picture. And until I take a year out and learn amazing Chinese, I will just have to, you know, get you on the podcast and interview you and ask. But is there, is, so the question I guess I would ask is, is there some middle ground in your other works that joins up uh, Woman Jia, Chili Bean, Pace Clan and this book? Or are they really just kind of uh, irreducible, unique beasts? Um, I was thinking about um, like um, this book because this morning, because we, we were on, supposed to do this interview I was like preparing myself thinking about is there anything I want to say about this book and one thing I do um like it, it did occur to me that the style of this book maybe Jeremy can either verify or to not agree with this uh, is that um I think the the sentences like the style um in this book were closer to classic Chinese language because I think that was uh, when I wrote this book I was at the point so I just I was in I was in my sophomore year right in the university and and I think before I actually went to the university mostly my literary influence um, was classic Chinese because I grew up in a family where everybody um was like a massive classic Chinese fan. And then we'd recite um, classic poetry at dinner table. And my granddad would give me this book in Chinese, it's called Gu Wen Guan Zhi. So it's like a thick, 
anthology of like classic Chinese essays and and he would force me to recite all of them which I did not manage to do but but that was sort of where I came from is like I was really immersed in this classic literature world and I didn't read much foreign literature um, at all until I went to the university and everybody was like even they talk about say people like William Faulkner I was like who's that and I felt I, I, at that point, I felt enormously, you know, kind of um, ashamed of myself for lacking that knowledge. But I think, and, and then um, obviously I made a conscious choice where I began to read um, like my peers in the university, more foreign, like an American or, or Latin American, you know, like whatever that's popular at that point. Lots of translation um, into mm. China, like so foreign literature from a Chinese point of view, surely. And then contemporary Chinese literature. I think I think then that influenced my style, maybe to the point where we had things like woman jia, where sentences have become um, noticeably much longer and com um, complicated and complex. Uh, whereas I think um, Yi Shou Zhi, Strange Beast of China, I think the way it was composed, like even on a sentence level, although I was making a conscious choice to make it more accessible, but I think that was definitely um, much more influenced by classic Chinese. So I, I feel like my wording, you know, the way I, I talk, I, I wrote was very different. So right. this was my <laughs> interpretation. Right. I don't know if Jeremy feels that or... Yeah, no, I definitely picked up on that and, and that fed into the translation. Um, for a lot of it, particularly when um, the beasts are being described, the language goes into something very classical, um, to the point that I was having to look up classical references to understand what was actually going on. Um, and there were a couple of places where I had to ask you, and I just do not get this, could you tell me what it is? And, and that's why for the translation, I gravitated towards um, a much more classical or classical seeming register. Um, so mm. even in the names of the beasts, mm. which we've touched on and which are in many ways the key to their personalities, um, it, it had to be things like joyous beasts rather than joyful beasts, which would probably be a more um, common way of saying it. Uh, it, it mm -hmm. I think had to feel like something that could have come from an ancient bestiary partly because mm. that's the lineage of where the book was, and partly because I think there is a gap between um, how the protagonist wants to come across and how she actually is. So when she's actually talking, her actual reported dialogue is often quite blunt, um, mm. slightly inarticulate. She can't quite put her feelings into words. But when she's describing the beasts, she goes into this very classical register. Um, as if she's trying to, either because she's trying to prove herself in some way, perhaps to the professor who, you know, is, is a big influence in her life, or perhaps because a lot of these beasts ultimately have ancient lineages and she's kind of tapping into that and you can't help but go into the, the history of, of bestiaries. You, you can't help but tap into that vocabulary when you start discussing them. Mm. Mm. yeah I, that's perfect because I was going to throw the question and say Jeremy what could you say about the classic the classical Chinese and bringing it into English but that's exactly what you did <laughs> perfect and I, I, I might come back to asking you about the vocabulary later but that's a good uh, a good seat to plant in the, gr the ground for now so I already indulged myself a minute ago asking about a, a band I really liked when I was a teenager or bringing up a band I really liked when I was a teenager Incubus but now I'm going to bring up a book I still, if someone asks me what my favorite book is, I still say it's this book. I think it's just because I'm fixed on it and it's an easy answer, but to some extent it's true. It's a book I really love. It's called I'm the Messenger. It's uh, by Marcus Suzak. And I kept thinking of it as, as, as I was reading Strange Beasts of China. And the reason for that is it's got the whimsy existential angst, the comedy, an episodic structure. It's got a little bit of a noir or certainly detective and mystery uh, element and the people the thing sorry this thing being investigated is other people in the society around you and later the people closest to you and then later turning inward um, without spoiling anything 
uh, it gets pretty meta. It's kind of a little bit meta all the way through, but just like Strange Beasts of China, we get more meta as we go on. Um, and if there's one thing I could try and say I'm the messenger's about, it's about breaking out of a state of apathy to find, and now I'm going to use very pretentious words, the beautiful, <laughs> painful truth of being alive and being in a society of other heartbroken souls. So listeners, you can probably hear I'm reading this off paper. Uh, I kept thinking of, yeah, like I said, I kept thinking of I'm the messenger. So again, trying to boil down this big train of thought into a question, what human truths should we be on the lookout or what truths, maybe human is a stupid word to use here. What truths should we be on the lookout for in Strange Beasts of China? And I'm wondering, especially about like general human existential truths uh, that you are evergreen versus ones that are particular to particular kinds of people or particular areas or societies is yeah what truths are is the book trying to tunnel down into and bring up for the reader or help the reader discover or think about i mean i don't know about be on the lookout for because i feel like while this book is full of, of human and beastly tricks um their best experience when they kind of creep up on you mm. Mm. What, what really struck me about the book, um, and I suppose this is a fundamental truth of life, is how unstable everything is. Just if you think you know where you are, um, both we as readers and the protagonists are constantly having the ground cut out from under us. Um, mm. And it's this thing about you constantly learning new things about the world that destabilize your understanding of, of how it works. And, uh, you know, you, as, as you move through the world, um, your perception of, of your place in it and, and how, how it all falls in balance is, is constantly shifting, as is the world itself. So I suppose if I had to reduce that to something, it, it would be you don't get too comfortable. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that's very true. Um, yeah, and to ask you something more specific, do you think... Strange Beasts of China says is capturing anything particular from uh, not just the time your life it was written in, but the time it was written in. Um, I'm thinking about this mm. for a few reasons. Uh, one, it's really, it's just selfish. Um, so the time I lived in China, um, mm. granted, it wasn't anywhere near Chengdu. It was last decade. <laughs> it was the 2010s um, and just the latter half of them, really. Um, so I read about um, not East China, China in the first decade of the 20th century, uh, saw pictures and stuff from it and was kind of led to understand mm. it was a little bit more, uh, less strict than it is now. Um, and I was thinking as I was reading the book, like, hmm, there's a few mentions to like a faceless, often kind of oppressive or uncaring mm. or not particularly pleasant government. I don't think it ever says it's a one party state. But I was just thinking, oh, could this could this book be published um, to, in today's China um, just for maybe that reason alone? Um, but probably the main question I'd say is how much, to what extent are we getting a snapshot of a particular time rather, as well as a particular time in a person's life? Is it is it there at all? Yeah, I, I was actually um, thinking about the same, like exact the same um, this morning when I was um, thinking about um, this book, um, whether or not it, this book could be, well, actually, like, I just had a sort of a, a latest version, so it, it, get, it had, like, a new edition, I think it was maybe two, three years ago, um, yeah, I was wondering if this will be published, will be able to get published now, and, um, but, mm. but, um, but, but one thing um, that I feel it's, it's funny, because this book, mostly um, people consider it like magical realism or some would say it's just pure fantasy. And and then it could be because of that um, assumption. So people are not really looking at it the way they would examine as quote unquote, like social realistic fiction. Cause they think, oh, this is pure, you know, like um, made up, um, like in the made up world. And so I think that definitely helped it because nobody was trying to <laughs> look into this 
gibberish um, story from a child. I think, especially back then when this book came out. But then, like when I look back into this book when I reread it now, I was really struck by how political、um, this book was. Like how much it talked about the 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 government or this like higher power or this you know this how the rulers. Or manipulating, controlling its people, and this was like touched upon repeatedly in this book, which was really unusual, I think. And then, and I, I couldn't remember、uh, why I did it. I suppose again, it could be like a very young person thing, isn't it? And it could just be again. I was saying、uh, I was living in this particular apartment with a bunch of、um, college、um, graduate students,、uh, mostly art students. I think those. Debates, you know, it could be part of the bigger discourse I was living in, in the sense, college students back then were very much engaged politically, in terms of examining and understanding how a politic like a Chinese politics system works, how maybe people were deprived of the rights to make certain choices, and how we were manipulated into believing that. We had choices, or yeah, I was I was just thinking like, well, this is me really guessing now because I obviously couldn't remember. Um, but it was it it definitely was like a reflection of the would you say that it's it's the atmosphere of the quasi intellectual circle because <laughs> it's like po- a bunch of co- college、yeah. postgraduates. So I'm not saying that's like very serious, but like you know that circle I was living in, and and it's like the atmosphere back then. Yeah, I don't know what that atmos- atmosphere would be like now. Obviously, yeah.、Mm. I'd much rather read about quasi intellectuals than really fully <laughs> fledged intellectuals. Much more interesting people. I think that's that's answered my question really. Although there is a second part to the question. So as well as being a snapshot of the past,、um, this came up on your when you、um, were in appropriately the、uh, London Chinese Sci-Fi、uh, Book Club's Zoom meeting. They were asking you, or they, they, you guys were talking about. How much the book kind of predicted the future.、Um, there's one chapter in particular where pand- a pandemic、uh, spreads. I think it spreads from Thailand into wherever Yongan is.、Um, yes,、yeah, so, like a non-specific, non-specified,、um, like tropical city.、Right. Is it in the south? Yeah, yeah. tropical、um, country. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's southeast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somewhere in Southeast Asia, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I so I'd been primed to expect. Oh, there's going to be a chapter that feels eerily similar to today because of a pandemic.、Um, but I just kind of thought, well, that's that's funny, isn't it? But then I read it, and I was like, oh, damn, this is this is weird reading this because although some of it, some of it maybe doesn't relate to the situation. I mean, so much of it does. I guess I'm not going to ask you if you think books can predict the future. The, que- the question, more interesting question, might be, what do we make of it when it feels like they do? I, I I was thinking about that actually. It's、um, this was in chapter seven, I think, and then all those people they went to this sort of southern country, and then there was this virus going on. The virus itself is violence, so there was a vi- riot there in the country, and then people with, was considered people who traveled there now returning to Yongan was considered being in contact with this. Virus of violence, and then they were all stranded in the airport, and they wouldn't. They were not allowed to enter the city, so they don't contaminate other people with this virus of violence. And then, in the end, all the people, all the citizens in the city, voted to、um, pretty much just kill all of those、um, travelers who had been to this this southern country. And I was reading that, and you know, because now obviously this is with COVID and. And、um, I, I don't think people are would. Be, I don't think it would be very easy for people who like overseas Chinese people to go back to China now, precisely for、mm. the in the sense like,、um, the citizens or your own countrymen voted to eliminate you, isn't it? It's not like they wanted to kill us. <laughs> they wanted to kill people who are not, but they pretty much just want to get rid of you to to um eradicate you um. And 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 I would think and now I I, I feel really kind of um chilling when I read that and then I thought how did this happen why 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 and um but but then I I thought the reason like I thought it was 
pretty much, you know, when I was writing that, it's like this person, this very young person who's quite, who has a very dark worldview in which she believes nobody is good. There is no real goodness in this world, in humanity. So I think in this sense, this person, um, this narrator, and also that me who were writing this book was um, anticipating, was sort of um, developing all the plots, everything based on the worst assumption mm. of humanity, of like of a government, of a sit of of all the citizens of, you know, I think it's it's really from a very dark place, and both for the narrator um, and also for the who implied author who wrote this book. It was I think it was from this very dark place where where she and I back then really just think about everything for the worst case scenario, for the darkest, the most inhumane reaction towards everything. But then sadly, some of it really was verified and you can see it's really like the worst in this was then sort of um, made up in that story. But now, because we were put in this very extreme scenario, which literally just brings out the worst aspects in this in us humans isn't it so so it's kind of like this very chilling kind of <laughs> surreal coincidence yeah well i also wonder yan um yeah uh you would have been writing this i think around the time of or soon after the sars epidemic um oh yeah it was it because mm. i totally forgot sars so what was sars i think it was around then yeah, um, let me see. Well, oh, yes. Haha. -ha. Thank you, Jeremy. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. So it's, uh, I was just Googling it. So it's 2022 to 2024. And I wrote this at 2020. Uh, sorry, it's 2002 to 2004. And I wrote this book at 2005. So yeah, ah, problem solved. Thank you. <laughs> I remember, um, I think it was around that turn of the millennium there was a very 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 like diet uh, panic like that when um foot and mouth disease uh, was spreading i think it was only able i don't know if it was able to hurt humans but as a small kid i remember having to dip my feet in disinfectant before going into shops in rural areas and stuff like that and i know my parents were a bit shaken i think it was maybe because they spent their lives thinking, maybe not my grandparents who'd lived through um, the home front of World War II, but um, generations after that, mine and my parents included in a country like the UK, we just think, oh, you know, things like that don't happen here. There aren't going to be any big ruptures or disruptions. But what you were saying about worst case scenarios resonates with me today, because I don't know, from, from, from my, my way of being ready for the future is going to just be assuming stuff crazy disruptions and ruptures are going to keep happening and i'm just going to have to um what's the word muddle through it the idea that it can't happen here seems to be an idea past its expiration date mm. so i th i'm sure a lot of the listeners wherever they are in the world maybe feel the same mm. it's come up on the show a few times um but without getting too miserable um let's keep going uh jeremy is your time to shine because i'm going to ask some questions about translating the book Although this first question could be for both of you. Um, so the book and its Chinese title, as far as I'm aware, um, don't specify China or anywhere in China as the setting, but the title of the English edition does seem to, because it's Strange Beasts of China. It's not Strange Beasts of Yong'an. Um, is there much we can say about the two's titles, um, either in general or in relation to the setting? I mean, the, the honest answer for me is that the title in English just clicked into place. Um, mm. It just felt right. Um, and often there is a protracted discussion with the publisher about what the English title should be. And it does often become quite different um, from the Chinese title because of different conventions in, in both um, areas. And also the, the perception that the title is really important in selling the book. Absolutely. Um, but in this case, um, Tilted Axis accepted the title um, with, without further discussion, um, so we didn't get into it. I think a more literal translation of the title would have been something like a compendium of strange beasts, 
which which would have felt too archaic to me. Mm. Um, that there is a classical tone to the book, but I don't think we ever wanted to get into the area where it felt archaic, where it felt like not connected to the present day. Mm. Yeah. Um, and, and for me, Strange Beast kind of navigated that distance. So it felt a little out of time, but also not something completely removed from the present. Right. Uh, Jan, is there anything you want to say? Um, I quite like the English title, actually. Yeah. And then the Chinese title, obviously, it's, um, it's like a zhi, like yi shou zhi zhi is like what Jeremy was saying. It's this very sort of an ancient, like a classic. And is that genre really is like in, in Chinese mm. and literature. And so, yeah, so it was... Um, this is again one of my not very popular idea of me being an obscure writer. But then, incidentally, I think I uh, might have mentioned this to Jeremy. Is like yi shou zhi, the pronunciation of those three characters, and um, sound like actually yi shou, like easy to sell. <laughs> so, <laughs> so people have um, asked me actually, um, did you name the book this way just to hope this book will sell more? Because you're literally naming it in this with the same pronunciation to, um, you know, the book that sells very easily. <laughs> um, I've flicked open to my uh, copyright page that has the, the Chinese title. So not because I know this character, but it's just visual recognition of the character. Is that one in the mm. original Chinese title of Pu Songling's uh, collections? Is that when you? Liao Zai Zhi Yi, yeah. So like Liao Zai Zhi Yi Zhi, that's the same. So Zhi is it's really like a genre. It's right. like I don't, I can't find. I I I'm not like erudite enough to know immediately what's the equivalent. Yes. Yeah, so. Yes. Um, if if there's a category for that in English like it's maybe just like strange tales or I think that's how I've heard these like kind of stories from n not just China but the kind of Japanese ghost stories as well I think they usually just get called strange tales or ghost stories but strange yeah, tales is better yeah because Jew yeah. is it's kind of like um, a non-official history right. it's sort of like a, the recording so it's a, like historical recording but it's not it's not written by you know the official historian it's not so it's kind of I don't know actually I'm I might be totally wrong. <laughs> okay, I'll just stop. Mm. Sometimes I wish that there was I, I had a twin who studied like Chinese studies instead of English lit, and he could come on the podcast and help me out with this stuff. But it's, it's just well, me. <laughs> I, I, I I did I I did study Chinese. You know that like I did study Chinese literature as an undergraduate, and so it's for but the like the time when I wrote this book, we were probably doing like cla full on classic Chinese during which time period I would be required to answer all the questions. If I were doing an exam, all the questions had to be answered in classic oh, Chinese no. and with only traditional Chinese characters. So that was, <laughs> so I was, you know, I'm supposed to still have that training, but obviously I've lost it. So. <laughs> mm. Do you mind? Do you guys mind if I uh, restart the meeting again? The timer is hitting yes, five minutes. Yes, I'm yes. starting to starting to get antsy. <laughs> I know. Okay. I almost want to keep it running to see how you would snap. <laughs> I'll start asking questions really fast. Um, start drinking <laughs> extra coffees. Okay. Um, right here we go. Okay. See you yeah. in a minute. So um, listeners, a, a disclaimer here, uh, I did a little bit of a goof on our initial interview. Um, I had to kind of restart Zoom a couple of times because it decided to impose that 40 minute timer countdown. And on our last little 40 minute session, right at the end of it, I realized I hadn't hit record. So from here on, what you're listening to is a, a take two. So if, if we sound uncannily precise in what we're saying, it's because we're kind of having a deja vu or it's our second rehearsal. Jeremy, here is a question for you um, about translating the book. Um, there's quite a lot of stuff I could have asked, um, but I thought this was the question I most wanted to ask. It's a little bit of a silly question, and it's just, as, as I was reading, I felt that as well as being like a very smooth translation, and as well as having, having just like on a very technical level, good word choice flowing nicely and so on, there were some quite unusual words which kind of stood out. It's the sort of words where you would, you might not have heard of it, or if you have heard of it, 
you just don't tend to see it very often. So when you hit upon it, it stands out. Um, when I went flicking through the book, the only example I could I was able to stumble across was Fecund, um, but I know there was more. So I just wanted to ask, was there anything particular that informed your choices for these more obscure words? I guess to me, they, they don't feel obscure. Um, maybe a little less common, but that was me responding to the um, what I felt was the exuberance and precociousness of the original. Um, Yen's novel just felt full of colour and life, and it pushed me to reach for quite often not the first word that comes to mind, but the second or third word, something a little unexpected, something with a bit more um, colour or resonance to it, because um, that, that felt truer to the original. And I, I I, think, mm. I, I say not obscure because they're all words that the reader would probably know the meaning of. Um, so it shouldn't send people to dictionaries. Um, but they were also words that I hope give that pleasurable sense of, huh, it's been a while since I've seen that one in a sentence. Right. I think that's that's the slightly uncanny territory that, that really um, seemed to fit this novel. Right. You, you've just expressed what I was stumbling around there. Words that sort of sit just on the right threshold of your like ability to recall or recognize them. And I think you're right. It does create a sort of a pleasurable um, effect because it's a, it's a book that we've already said a lot of things about. Um, but one thing I probably can't restate enough is it's like a pleasure to read. OK, our next set of questions are are fun questions. Um, we've had quite a serious chat so far. We've we've gone fairly deep. Now we're going to go back into lighter stuff. So uh, Yen and Jeremy, um, you guys maybe know, well, I guess you do know because we're on our second take, that um, on every episode of the show, we do a sort of a, a word of the day, a Chinese word of the day. And handily, in the case of Strange Beasts of China, um, the publisher, Tilted Axis, actually picked a word. Um, they, I guess they do this for, for all their books. They'll find an interesting word from the uh, original language of the text, and then they'll give its definition. Um, so here we have the Chinese character, it's pinyin, and then the English, and that character is shou, uh, for beast. So I'll just read the definition they've given for it, um, which is, uh, shou was originally used to describe the act of hunting. The meaning of the word shifted over time to the object of the hunt, the prey. More than a neutral word for animal, show denotes the absence of humanity and carries the connotations of savagery and wildness. So it's really quite a perfect choice. I'm just wondering if we can top it. Do you guys have, uh, well, I know you do because we did this last time. What other word could we um, add to that one for a word of the day? Well, as we said before, um, the original Chinese title of the book is Yi Shou Zhi. Um, we chose Shou for the Tilted Axis um, publication, but today we could look at the first word of the title, Yi, which means strange, unusual, um, separate, but also has a connotation of, of change or transformation. Um, and that, that seems quite appropriate um, for, again, that word uncanny, um, that space that is slightly adjacent to our world, that, that feels like a really fertile ground for exploration, um, where we're slightly outside of ourselves and seeing ourselves a little bit um, from a different angle. The way when you catch a glimpse of yourself in a mirror when you're not expecting it, it takes a second for your brain to register, oh, that's me. And I think that's what this book does. It gives us a glimpse of humanity, but defamiliarized, looking strange. Yeah, I was just about to say, as I, I mentioned last time, and I, I second that we need to, we should choose E to be like our character of the day, because that also is Jeremy's name, like in Chinese. So, and, and I think all the explanations were, he really beautifully um, put out there, like how this idea of E really represents so many different things. And well, 
actually this notion of it, I mean, you could interpret it into、uh, in different ways, and all of those、um, such like the way Jeremy、um, just put it, like everything out there, like. You glimpse this image in the mirror and didn't realize, and that was you for a minute. I almost feel we needed to invent like、mm. this is such a common phenomenon, yet we don't really have like a fixed word for it. So I almost feel this is we need to look for like through different languages to see if you know possibly <laughs> in I don't know Icelandic language there would be like a word for this really kind of a such a chilling and yet you know like we. Re recurring an image and、um, sensation in our life. I thought, and also, yeah, that is a perfect metaphor, an image for what strange beasts of China stand for. It is to show us ourselves in the image of the others. But what really we're talking about is ourselves. I thought that was brilliant. Yeah, I, I, I really like what Jeremy said. Everything he just said there.、Hmm. You've just reminded me, Jeremy. There's a room in my granny's house where there's a mirror on one wall, and on the opposite wall there's a mirror. And if you stand in the middle and kind of lean yourself at the right angle, you can see yourself reflected infinitely. Yeah. So I remember when I was young, I had a, I, I would go to that room a lot and create that effect, and then you know I've sought it out since. And any time you have one of those mirrors that has the kind of flaps on either side, and you can manipulate them. To create, you know, you can try and see your head from all the different angles, and I find there is like a weird way where you can turn that fleeting glimpse of yourself from an angle you've never seen, and you can freeze it. And it is one, yeah, it's one of the strangest, strange, strangest,、um, most clearly recognizable and replicable encounters with the uncanny I can think of having had is not just having that fleeting glimpse, but seeing either. Thousands of iterations of yourself or yourself from、um, an angle you wouldn't have expected, and I guess both of those kind of describe strange beasts of China, like you were saying.、Um, speaking of uncanny, I remember in our <laughs> our first、uh, go at this this part of the interview, I did a call back to、um, nominative determinism.、Um, I was I asked you, Jeremy, if the Yi in your name had proven true at all for you. Well, my surname Tiang、um, is Cheng in Mandarin, which can mean journey. So you could translate my name Cheng Yi as strange journey,、yeah. um, which is a pretty apt description of my life. So, yes, perhaps. <laughs>、um, although that's really a pen name, so in a way, that's something、right. I chose for myself. I remember at this point in the chat, I tried to make some、um, clever comment about my.、Um, The origins of my name, but the thing is, there there's nothing interesting to say there. So forget it. <laughs>、um, let's go on to the next question. It's the it's the other kind of really silly question I do for this show, and it's、um, about if the book was a drink.、Um, the drink that is burned into my memory from reading the book the most is the all the beer that the characters drink in the Dolphin Bar, which was my favorite setting in the book.、Um, Trying to visualize it, I was visualizing it either as a kind of a young hip person's bar or a China, like a Chinese student bar, which is like a, at least in my experience, was a very like you could, if you as soon as you see it, you know what it is. Like it will have cheap drinks, it'll have、mm -hmm. dice on the tables.、Um, so I had a, a, a kind of a flicking between one picture and the other of what the Dolphin Bar was and what people were drinking. All that aside,、uh, a question for both of you. If Strange Beasts of China was a drink, what kind of drink do you think it would be? And you're allowed、uh, hot drinks, cold drinks, soft drinks, alcoholic drinks,、uh, whatever you like. I remember Jeremy, you had an answer involving a particular style of cocktail. I forget if you had one, Yan. Well, but this is in itself quite an uncanny experience that we're kind of recreating <laughs> a conversation from a few days ago that we all sort of remember. Um, at, yes. At the weekend, or did I already say this this time round?、Um, uh -huh. But yeah, I do remember that、um, the drinks I most associated with this book were the drinks that I had when I first discovered drinking,、um, and I think like a lot of people,、um, I got overexcited and really into、um, those types of cocktails that really have one too many ingredients. And come in lurid colors, and and have、um, 
to over long names and come with accessories um, like bendy straws. Um, mm. and, and that that I think feels like the book. It, it's kind of an exuberance and, and abundance of, of imagination and ideas. Um, and you keep hitting new patches of flavor. Mm. Um, what you said about the uncanny experience, it's it's weird for me. I was thinking, oh, I've done this before. All the words are going to flow off my tongue. But um, you guys heard me stumble like pretty early on. I just, my train of thought completely abandoned me. The listeners won't hear that because I will have edited it out. So, <laughs> um, yeah, and I forgot. Do, do you have a, a, a special drink that you'd associate with? Yeah, I I cannot believe you forgot it because I brought up that and you're oh, like, no. I have to try it. And it's, uh, I wasn't, uh, I was oh, saying I remember last now. time. Yes, yes. Yeah, so it's not really about like, the atmosphere of this book per se but it, it is like a popular drink I was mentioning like I was um, living in this student apartment and all the people the graduates and um, who live there and this sort of really cheap cocktail it's not really a cocktail was re- very popular among like the college graduates and and then and then I said in Chinese it's called um, xiao er gan niu. so roughly translated is like a young male person it's kind of actually it's like a a, a waiter in like in, in classic Chinese so it's like this young man is driving a, a kettle um which is a mixture of a uh, red bowl and our guoto so it's like this very strong baiju like Chinese liquor if I remember correctly it would be kind of like 52 percent of alcohol mm-hmm. and that mixed with and Red Bull <laughs> and both are like quite you know quite inexpensive sort of um really mm-hmm. like affordable by students that, that type of drink I you, I remember we used to drink that a lot sort of you know kind of intermittently drinking that and with beer and which often caused quite a disastrous um outcome <laughs> oh, man. yeah so that was the thing I was mentioning and it's just um I don't I haven't I don't, yeah, it wasn't for this particular conversation. I don't think I would have remembered it because mm. I don't think I've tried. I, the last time I drank that was probably at least, yeah, 10, 12, maybe probably 14, 15 years ago. <laughs> yeah, I feel quite ashamed of myself for, for not remembering that, but I remember now. On our first, <laughs> listeners should know, uh, on our first uh, attempt at recording when uh, Yan was telling us that story, I was like, I was reacting with uh, shock and horror, but also some some awe. Um, and, and I guess Baijiu's not impossible to come by in the UK. That's a drink I could probably recreate for myself, although I don't know if I would want to. Yeah, it's like um, caffeine and alcohol, isn't it? It's not like, I don't know what's in Red Bull actually, but it's, it seems it's... A lot of sugar, I think, as well as caffeine. Oh, okay. So, sh- wow, that's yeah. or syrup or something. There was actually a not completely different uh, drink that was really popular when I was starting at university. Um, the Jägerbomb, Jägermeister mixed with Red oh. Bull, and I was really not. A, I wasn't that kind <laughs> of a party kid, but for some reason, I think it was my dad, one of my parents when I went off to university, leaving home for the first time, kitted me out with some Red Bull and a bottle of Jägermeister. But once I finished that bottle, I never bought another one. Once was enough. <laughs> and like, this is not surprising. The drinks all the uh, university students came up with, it's quite, it's almost like um, a universal language across different countries <laughs> and cultures. For sure, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, if if the listeners can bear me giving another um, early early drinking days anecdote, uh, what Jeremy was saying about <laughs> when you start drinking, uh, this one is it's quite firm in my memory because it's an embarrassing or it's a story that I feel embarrassed about. So I started drinking properly. I was hanging out with uh, two girls who were um, what's the word? I was quite a well behaved teenager. They were slightly more edgy, and they introduced me to this uh, like a cheap. A cheap, uh, very sweet cider, uh, popular with kids when they start drinking in the UK and also with um, tramps and alcoholics. Um, And we would put like diluting juice, so very sweet, sugary, fruity stuff into it to flavor it, blackcurrant flavor. And I remember I had like one pint-sized glass and got could feel it was affecting me really heavily. And I thought, oh no, I can't even drink one pint. I'm useless. And then realized months later, it was something like, (laughs) 
eight percent strength um so yeah I, I it's hard to relate that to strange beasts of china except there's there's something about being young and naive and getting into alcohol for the first time yeah i mean well i i don't know if i should further like prolong this question <laughs> but i kind of feel the most dangerous one is that those when you are drinking it you don't realize how alcoholic it mm. is it tastes like coca-cola or just just something purely harmless and i think in that sense it's like um uh, it's 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 like the strange beast of china the book and it it sort of lures you in quite harmlessly and maybe after finishing two pints you thought it was just pure like coca-cola and then you were like sudden all of a sudden just suddenly just knocked out by it i think there are i i can't remember the names but there are a few times in my life when i got very drunk was all because of that type of drink like you didn't mm. realize how much alcohol was in it and yeah so i kind of feel that is more like the experience of or the, the the experience that i hope the reader would get from reading strange piece of china is that you don't realize but you're so drunk and then suddenly you realize and you couldn't get up <laughs> i mean that's definitely the effect it had on me cuz it is a fun fantastical book and you're kind of just cruising along enjoying it um and very unprepared for the emotional whammy and the existential questions it raises mm. absolutely mm. um i'll end the, this alcohol wine conversation by saying i think spirits should not taste good spirits should be hard to drink not easy um because if they taste too good then yeah you end up in trouble last silly question um which beast in this book do each of you think you would be or are most like um Anyone who wants to go first can go first. I guess I know what you're both going to say, but I'll be interested to see if you're going to say yeah. <laughs> exactly the same word for word. We're like we're so strict because you know we could we could have taken a total different strategy, which is to not acknowledge that we have recorded this before, and then we just pretend mm. you know this was the first recording, whereas we've acknowledged it up front, and then every bit when we move forward, we re we kind of. <laughs> It's funny, like we're we're showing this as a duplica, but it's funny because then the the original was lost, so nobody would be able to see or hear the original. But then we were like so eager to claim we're only like we're, <laughs> we're only doing this like a fake layer, like a second layer to sort of copying the to copy the original, and we just make that claim repeatedly.、Mm. It's kind of fun. Okay, I'm just <laughs> I'll. I'll I'll say the beast,、uh, the the kind of beast I want to be, because this is a set an、um, answer for me, and it's a flourishing beast, and I really like that because,、uh, I think I definitely have mentioned this in in other interviews and events, and、um, because I wrote this type of beast, and thinking about my mom、uh, who had just passed away, so it's a it's this group of um sort of like a female beast, like women who lives in this nunnery, and and they have this very Like intimate sense of community and looking after each other, so it's like a, a matriarchy society where people are just like loving and supporting each other, and it's a, it's a little bit zen in the sense of those beasts having the shape of human, or just wanted to be. And、um, eventually, I think the perfect form for them for their lives would just be becoming wood. So I thought that was something that spoke very、um, deeply to me. Um, especially when I was writing it. So yeah, yeah.、Um, I remember at one of those other events you did, the one with the London Chinese Sci-Fi Group,、uh, Angela, Angela Chan, who was interviewing you. I think I recall she said she really appreciated the parts of the book where we met beasts who have some kind of, as well as being different as individuals, they have a sort of different, or they have some kind of parallel or alternate society or social structure. So if it's All female or matriarchal or outside gender society's gender norms and stuff. I remember she said she really liked that, and I think yeah, it, it's in the book. It's very, it's done with a lot of nuance and it's interesting. I guess because they're beasts, they're not. There's nothing you can really predict about how their society is going to be because yeah, it's、mm. it's literature. It's showing you things from that unfamiliar angle. So yeah, I I, I like those parts too.、Um, Jeremy, what? What's、uh, what? What's your answer this time around?、Um, I think I said something similar last time.、Um, 
which is that the through the book, um, which is set up like a bestiary, a different beast in each chapter, as the protagonist gets to know each different beast and writes about it, a kind of Stockholm syndrome takes place where she always starts to side with the beasts um, against humankind and sees them as less other and more like herself. Um, and I, I felt a similar process as I was translating the book um, where I, I both um, got very, felt very close to the protagonist, but also to each individual beast, which I think is by design because they do reflect different aspects of humanity just taken one step too far. Mm. Um, so I think on different days or even at different times of the day, I am many of these beasts, one after another. Oh, it's a, it's, it's a very good answer. And you've uh, you put it even better than you did last time. Um, so thanks. <laughs> I, I actually wanted to do another callback to something you said in the London Chinese Sci-Fi Group interview, Yen. Um, mm. Maybe maybe there's, maybe the, I'm asking an overly direct question here, asking you for some kind of literal interpretation. But I remember you said you dis, you wanted to write about um, like sort of marginalized or outsider people in society, maybe in Chengdu mm. itself, I'm not sure. But you thought the more interesting literary thing to do is to use beasts as a sort of a metaphor. Um, I know that's a very sort of brute way of framing the question, but um, I'm going to do it. Are any of the beasts kind of very directly inspired by any particular groups or people or subcultures? Or is it all sort of taking from lots of different sources and combining in a creative way? Mm, or would you just rather not I, tell the readers? I, no, no, no. I mean, um, I'm just trying to recall. And um, again, I think I, I mentioned it to you um, that I don't quite remember like lots of details mm. when I was working on this book, but I remember um, so around the time when I was at least thinking about writing this book, um, I made a trip to the north part of Chengdu. So the, um, because I don't like, uh, I'm not from Chengdu. So Chengdu to me at that point, Chengdu would be like considered the prototype of Yongan. And so that city to me was a new city. I came from like a nearby town. And to, so I was taken to the north part. Oh no, sorry, the east part of the city. Yeah, I, actually the north and east are both quite run down at that point. So I was taken to the run down part of the city. And I was really, you know, it really struck me to see like all those abandoned um, factories um, because I think there were, I couldn't remember the name, but then you see the, the old factories and, and I think some of them might have been like a military factory, you know, for a while, I think. So in China, those are called, well, it's called Sanxian Gongchun, I think maybe it's like th line three project. Uh, um, it's like the, the country decided it's just in case we're going to go into a war with Soviet Union and we're going to oh, um, yeah. establish like a series of military um, factories, mostly in this inner land. So like Chengdu, Chongqing. So there were like factories like that. And at that point would have been abandoned. But then people who um, moved to Chengdu from some northern city or, you know, they, I don't know where they came from, but like the community. And um, so like the factory workers and then their family. And then maybe they would have like a hospital, you know, all those communities surrounding this factory. The, the whole thing moved from somewhere else to Chengdu. And then they speak, I think people there, they will speak Mandarin. Mm. And it's like this enclosed society and now sort of being forgotten because then this whole project was canceled after the Soviet Union and, you know, just... <laughs> collapsed mm. I don't know what's the word yeah. for. and so yeah it's kind of like this this group of people that was just left like forgotten by history um, and then they were like you know kind of trying to find new aims for them to um, continuing to reside in this city and um, yeah and, and I think I was really struck by that image of seeing those abandoned factory in the more rundown part of the city and encountering people from those communities um, that might have inspired, say, the first beast, at least, mm. like the, um, the Sorrowful Beast. Right. Yeah. Fantastic answer. Yeah, I'll just mention uh, my favorite beast from the book, or at least the one that I maybe identified with the most, um, because 
although I'm often, you know, I'm often quite cheerful, I do have quite a fairly strong melancholy side to my personality and I'm doing a literature podcast. So I guess I'm fairly bookish and there are some kind of bookish downbeat uh, beasts in the book and they're the impasse beasts. And Yen, I know you can, you have a pretty interesting thing you can say about um, where their <laughs> name uh, is drawn from. And you you have free license here to uh, explain as much as you want. Oh, I I feel awful for explaining it because I I hate to do like a Chinese explaining. <laughs> it's like people, please listen to me tell you something very specific about my culture. <laughs> but yeah, I was just saying last time, like the ink pass, um um in Chinese, like the Chinese name of this beast was Chong Tu. So Chong Tu was a very specific specific phrase that first um, appeared, actually, I haven't really done the research. It might have not been the first time, but the most famous <laughs> association um, between uh, Chong Tu and then the literary image will be this um, Jing Dynasty poet whose name is Ran Ji. So he'd be riding like a donkey or a horse. And then whenever he goes, he roams in the wilderness and then he just felt he has hit the end and then he'd cry and then go home so that that was like something he does so then we have um, an idiom which is called chong tu zhi ku. so it's like the cry you have when you hit the end it's really to de- it's to describe i think it's to describe this um this psyche of his uh, or of this type of literary being is like naturally like innately depressed <laughs> And I think that sort of um, literary psyche and really affected um, generations after generations of Chinese literary people. So it had become a very sort of an important um, image. What would you call, would you say that's like a a Chinese literary consciousness? Mm. And yeah, so that was, I think I might have said a lot more last time, but (laughs) pretty much that was. Yeah, yeah. I think think that's about what you said. Yeah, I'd never heard that story before. I, I'm willing to bet loads of the listeners um, are have found that really interesting. And I can imagine one or two of them might be diving into Google or, or Baidu um, after they're finished listening. Yeah, if I if I could add, I just I just wanted to add this one mm. bit is like this particular poet, like this Jin Dynast poet. So they he belonged to a group where we call it's like Zhu Ling Qixian. So it's like seven cents in the bamboo forest so this literary group and they were all kind of famous for like their eccentric behaviors and i think research has shown that all of them are like really heavy drug users oh. so they're just like high all the time that that sort of explains like he <laughs> just rides his donkey and cries and goes home because he's like high all the time and, and i thought that was very interesting because that was not emphasized obviously on the textbook mm. but the fact like they really believe in using drugs <laughs> don't know what I'm trying to promote who knows <laughs> but I think that is an that is an aspect you know like the, the the heavy using of drugs really affected you know really became like the main thing of their literature like for that generation for that sort of period and it sort of um it developed into this um special kind of like spirit like I was saying it's like this special uh, literary psyche and mm. yeah yeah I remember um on, on round one I forget exactly how it came up but I was make, making a point that I've I've had in my head for a while, which is that there are some things that are really specific to one culture or another, but there are other things that are quite, I think, quite easy to understand. So like based on like having having spent time in China, having, you know, visited museums, read stuff, blah, 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 blah. Um, the, the archetype of the kind of disappointed or frustrated scholar who couldn't get into the exams or couldn't get as far enough into his uh, career as he wanted to get and kind of lives a dejected life that might be fairly specific to um, China and Chinese history but I think at least as a westerner it makes a huge amount of sense to me Um, it's it's easy to relate to um, and I forget exactly how I got onto it last time but I remember my Chinese friends would sometimes say well some of them would some say something along the lines of to me uh, oh you're a westerner you don't understand uh, Chinese family values. You you value individual freedom and blah blah blah. And I would kind of go, huh? Wait a minute. I think you've misunderstood. Of course, we have fam- we place importance on family values and so on back where I'm from. But yeah, maybe it's mm. just weighted differently. Um, there, it's the same things, but the scales are tilting a different way. 
Yeah, I, I think this is quite typical, isn't it? In the sense of, I know this, I don't know if I should keep like sort of nagging about mm. it, but I think it's quite important. It's like we consider each other, you know, people in China and people from the, let's just say Western countries. Um, people tend to consider other people from a different tribe, from a different culture, the strange beast. Right. But where in reality, it's just like the story within the strange beast of China is like everybody could be a strange beast, but that strange beast also is yourself. We have so much in similarity rather than having things differently. Like those are both sort of, you know, like valid aspects of our beings. But at the same time, I think it just depends on which aspect we're being emphasized. Totally. Yeah. Like I know a a stereotype about a a Western person might be, oh, they're so extroverted and selfish, blah, blah, blah. And a stereotype about a Chinese person might be there. They're more quiet and reserved. But like the reality is, you know, if you live in the UK, you'll meet plenty of people who are quiet and reserved. And you go over to China, you'll, you'll, you'll meet people who are they are the you know the stereotype of a Western personality. So yeah, I think you're right. Um, it makes more sense in many ways to take people as strange, um, strange beasts, things you can't boil down to any kind of template. Right. So that's our fun questions all done. Um, now on to just the, the very last section, uh, further reading. So only a few days have passed since uh, take one. I actually did finish the book I was reading in that time. I was reading uh, Beijing Coma. I finished that and I've now picked up a much smaller book, uh, also a translated Chinese one. It's Yu Hua's China in 10 Words, and I'm I'm really enjoying it. But what about you guys? What are you reading just now? Jeremy, do you want to go first? Uh, Sure, yes. Um, Right now I'm reading um, Polly Barton's book, 50 Sounds, um, which is coming out from Fitzcarraldo this April, but I was lucky enough to get an advanced copy. Um, It's a kind of essay memoir about um, how she came to be a translator and about her time in Japan, um, because she spent a lot of time there. Um, But the most exciting thing about it is how it's organized, which is, as the title implies, around 50 different types of Japanese onomatopoeia. Um, And she sort of extrapolates from the way the Japanese language describes these sounds to much larger themes. Um, But the best way to illustrate this is if I just read you a selection of um, some of the contents. Um, Mm, Fantastic. These are just a few of the chapter chapter headings. So this is just the table of contents. Um, But there are chapters called things like uka uka, the sound of all this being slightly wrong. <laughs> Oroboro, the important sound of things falling apart. Gutari, the sound of your words having more power than you thought, or unexpectedly mm. saying, what do you mean? Mm. That's, uh, as a podcaster, I can relate. I, I mean, and, and the book lives up to its chapter headings, but it's just a really... Um, interesting but also visceral um, way of organizing the book because sounds and and the emotions and memories they evoke in us um, can be really powerful Um, and she's a really thrilling writer in the way she captures these sensations but also digs down deeper um, past the surface to show what else is going on underneath there it's um it's fascinating it's a great book Fantastic. Uh, one more time, what was it called? Uh, 50 Sounds by Polly Barton. Awesome. Thanks, Jeremy. And mm. Yen, what are you reading? Well, <clears throat> I was saying last time that uh, I have a thick pile of different books um, on my M reading list because I sort of um, shuffle <laughs> from book to book. And so since Jeremy mentioned this, I was just, I immediately Googled it and it looks really fascinating. I think I'm going to buy it when it, and when it's coming out. And so in the spirit of this very sort of, um, this book, like the, the book Jeremy mentioned, I thought it was a book for people who are very interested um, in words and languages. So in the spirit of the nomination of this book, I'm going <laughs> to mention, there's another book I'm reading is an, um, um, it's from this um, um, British writer, I believe. Her name is Ely Williams. 
I think she just had um, a novel coming out. It's called The Liar's Dictionary. And this one I'm reading is A Trip um, and Other Stories. So it's her short story collection. And it's it's really clever. And it's a lot about like words, like different um, different kind of fun words. I couldn't really think of like a prominent example. But I think she seems to be a writer whose relation with English language, like with different words, are very close. Um, that I really enjoy, and I think reading um, at least this short story collection. I think I might get the novel at a certain point. Yeah. So. Awesome. Cool. And I realize I, I've reversed the order of these questions. Um, so last, our last question is: Do you have any books to recommend for our listeners? So that could be stuff somewhat tangentially related to Strange Beasts of China, or it could be just anything you think the show's listeners might really enjoy. Have you got anything that you'd recommend? Yeah, Jeremy, go first, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, um, the um, I, I think I did recommend this the last time around. Um, Kaming Chang's Bestiary. Perfect, yeah. Um, right. Um, so uh, Kaming Chang's Bestiary came out um, last year. And it's about a Taiwanese American family's um, struggle to to survive, really. Um, not even so much to fit in as just to get a toehold in an inhospitable country. And the young daughter um, coped with that um, through vivid feats of imagination, a lot of which are animalistic in nature, hence the name of the book. And the cover shows um, a young girl who is dressed as a tiger with a tail. And, and the, the protagonist of the novel actually does have a tiger's tail, which may or may not be metaphorical. Again, it inhabits a very um, uncanny space where a lot of it is fantastical or imaginative, but it's also not really a naturalistic world. And I, I love that kind of ambiguous space. So a lot of it is very resonant um, with strange beasts, even beyond the um, coincidence of the bestiary. Thanks for the answer. Um, I'm going to throw in some too. And here's two really good books I know listeners will enjoy. Um, one is a little book called Chili Bean Pace Clan uh, by one of our guests on the show right now. <laughs> That's uh, one of three works I believe of yeah, is available in translation the other one is White Horse which I've not read so I assume it's great but um, I, I I don't know but um, the Chili Bean based, based Paste Clan is <laughs> a fantastic novel um, it's uh, very different as we said from Strange Beasts but um, I can't recommend it enough and the other one I'll recommend it's I think yeah the only full length uh, Jeremy Tiang translation I've read Second Sister um, which I guess has something in common with Strange Beasts in it that uh, it's, we've got a female um, protagonist involved in an investigation. But apart from that, it's really different. But I suppose the other thing it has in common is it just reads really smoothly, um, reads just as well, if not better than lots of untranslated books out there. Maybe that's a bit of a crass way to, to um, promote it, but I was turning the page as fast as I possibly could. I really enjoyed reading that one. And the third one I'll recommend is in, in, I'm not going to try and flatter you the review. Um, it's the book I mentioned earlier in the episode, I Am the Messenger by Marcus Suzak. I think if, if anyone reads or has read Strange Beasts and they really enjoy the kind of detective side of things, the investigating first strangers, then your friends, then yourself. And if you like the kind of combination of a, a fairly light tone that gets really emotionally, um, I can't think of a better word than deep, but that really um, gets deep into a person's life and their state of mind. It's just, it's, that's why I love that book. It's so great. So I'd recommend that as well. Um, that's, that's just about it for our interview. Um, Yen and Jeremy, is there anything we've missed um, that you guys would like to say before I say my thank yous and my goodbyes? Um, I want to recommend Jeremy's book. Um, <laughs> you've, um, oh yeah, because... that's right. Because just on the note of um, how enjoyable it is to read Jeremy's translation, because he himself is a terrific writer, I really wanted to recommend Jeremy's short story collection, because that was the book really I fell in love with, Jeremy Tan, the writer. Um, and it's called It Never Rings on National Day. 
and it's such a gorgeous book and I think geographically um it just it takes me to so many places I think like when I first come across with that when I first read that book um up to this point like I've lived in a foreign country for maybe I don't know how many years not like substantial amount but I think it really speaks to me as my journey as an an outsider, a person who's like constantly roaming, who doesn't know where the idea home is. I think that book really speaks to me in many different ways and um, from its, via its many short stories and um, my own experience of like living in different places, living in different language. Yeah, so I, I really would strongly recommend that book for anybody who enjoyed Strange Beasts of China and I think you might have enjoyed more Jeremy's writing than my content. <laughs> Should really go read Jeremy's books. And and he has a novel also called the uh, the State of Emergency. And um, yeah, I, I think Jeremy's. Um, oh, I don't um, I don't know how Jeremy could do so many different things at the same time. To be honest, I must say that I'm very envious. Oh, that's you. Thank you again. I mean, I should say I'm very envious. <laughs> And for being able to write in two languages um, extremely effectively, um, which is like having two different voices, I think, as a writer. That's great. Um, everyone look up for Yen's English language work, which is coming your way soon, hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> Exciting. I'll be sure to promote that on the show when um, when the time arises. I remember, oh, me. <laughs> <laughs> I remember first time around, Jeremy, I asked you... Um, a question about it always rains on national day um i know the answer is yes but i'll just ask it anyway does national does the nation in national day refer to uh, singapore it does yes uh national day is um the day singapore became independent um august 9th and the title of the book refers to an urban legend that it doesn't rain on national day when there is a big outdoors parade um, because according to various explanations, um, the government seeds the clouds um, beforehand to make sure that it's all rained out by the time of the parade, or um, there are more fanciful theories that they carry out um, magic rituals um, to keep the rain away. Um, I've heard all kinds of things. No one will confirm or deny anything, but there is this kind of collective memory that somehow it does indeed never rain during the parade. Um, and that has become a kind of metaphor for how um, efficient and controlled and manicured Singapore can be. Fantastic answer. Um, I guess it really is time to say goodbye now. So I'll just say again, thank you both so much for coming on the show and I guess being being so happy to do this the second take I, I really appreciate that and it's been a fantastic chat and I could go on and go on and go on seeing how great it's been but it's because it's true so we have reached the end of the show uh, before I bid farewell here's some plugs so if you're a new listener and you'd like to subscribe to the show well you're in luck there's about a million zillion ways you can do it um, the show's available for, through all your uh, favourite or least favourite podcast providers. So think along the lines of uh, iTunes, Google Podcasts. I, I like to use Player FM. I think that was because it worked well in China or it was easy to download the MP3s and not just stream them. I forget, but just arbitrarily, that's who I use. Uh, Spotify. We're on Spotify too. Uh, I also upload the episodes to YouTube. That's more so people can find me than, so, than, than that people can subscribe. But we are on YouTube. I think the podcast home page is a good place to go to because uh, that's where I put all the show notes in full and the episode art and there's lots of interesting things like you can browse by different tags I assign to the episodes. So for example, if you want to check out only, let's say, the uh, episodes on Chinese sci-fi, there's a button for that and there's the support page as well. So speaking of support, if you'd like to you know, give a, give something back uh, to the show, basically, and get something in return for giving something back, then uh, go to the support page or uh, directly go to the show's 
Patreon or the Buy Me A Coffee, if you want to buy me a proverbial coffee. Um, Patreon and the Podbean Premium feed will get you access to all the bonus shows. There are 30 or 40 plus of them now, hours and hours and hours of content. Uh, thoughts on like uh, non-fiction books, which I wouldn't do on the show. Thoughts on books written in English, but with some kind of China connection um, or Sinosphere connection. Uh, those are on there. And p- preliminary thoughts. So when I uh, have just read a book and kind of like my initial reactions, I guess it's the old uh, internet, or not old, the fairly new, I suppose, reaction format. My reaction to Strange Beasts. And then if it was a video, there would be my shocked face on the thumbnail or something like that. Um, but yeah, there, there's your there's your ways you can support the show uh, tangibly, which means with money, by the way. But that is not the best way you can support the show. Uh, the best way you can support the show is by spreading the word, because ultimately I'm not in this for money making or even a career i am in this for the love of it and to spread the word so you you guys can spread the word too Uh, if you know someone who would like the show then tell them (laughs) um if you'd like to boost the show a bit um beyond just like sharing episodes then do leave uh, reviews and comments and ratings on whichever podcast service you use um itunes is a really good one i found that um There's like a kind of two sides to having a very diverse worldwide listenership. And the plus side is, um, well, that that you're not in a bubble. That's the plus side. And you're more open to reviews like that. The downside is, um, at least on the iTunes or Apple podcast uh, platform, every review goes to a a different um, geographic version of the Apple podcasts um, store or library or whatever it's called. So we have something like eight reviews, but if you're on applepodcast.com or whatever, you'll own the American one, you'll only see a couple of them. I think there's even a separate UK one. So I only see the UK ones. And then I know that there's, um, a really nice, uh, review on, I think the Brazilian, no, Peruvian is a review from a guy in South America. Anyway, um, a, re- a really nice listener of the show. So Given the fact that iTunes divides us all into our little geographic camps, let's fight that and <laughs> um, either get reviews onto all of them or cross post or whatever. Um, I'm not really urging you to do that. I just think it's an interesting uh, quirk of how iTunes podcast reviews work. Wow, we've really moved on from plugs, haven't we? It's just me rambling again. I'll, I'll just do the bit where I tell you who to tell. So tell your friends, tell your family and tell yourself, because you may know none of those people. They may be a beast deep down inside, but if you do figure out what kind of beast they are, and they still want to talk to you, tell the beast about the show too, because that's an angle of diversity I think we're really missing. We have lots of human listeners, but we could do with more beasts. Unless, of course, all you people are beasts. That is a possibility. So whatever you are, tune in for the next episode when that comes out. And do browse the back catalogue as well. Loads of great stuff there too. Anyway, Sai Jian.